We continue our study uh, in the book of Daniel. As you know, we're on lesson seven. It's an absolutely amazing book, an intriguing book. Uh, We're going to dig into chapter five this week. I'm always amazed that Daniel has only 12 chapters and how much is in those 12 chapters. Uh, We've seen so much already early in the book of Daniel. We've seen that obedience to God is very important to him. Why? Because that obedience to God is what's best for us. He created his ways not to be a tyrant over our lives because he knows that his ways are what's best for our life. And that obedience is critical. We have seen through Daniel so far that obedience to God and his ways will bring deliverance. And it may not always be as we expect that deliverance to be or occur, but we do see that in God's timing, his ways do bring deliverance. We've seen that worship of God is very important as per his instructions and it's a very serious and crucial matter. God was very serious about worship, again, for our benefit. It was in Daniel's day, worship was critical. It was important. The Bible says that in the last days, worship will be critical. We've dug deeply into Daniel and also the companion book of Revelation, which has been amazing. And we see that we seem very seriously to be living in those last days, as the Bible calls them, as Jesus called them, the end times, the last days before Christ returns to this earth, as he said he would for his people. Today's lesson seven is entitled The Fall of Babylon. We have seen so far in our studies that Daniel was taken captive when the mighty Babylon overran, overtook, and conquered Jerusalem. He was probably 12 or 13, 14 years old. He, his, lifespan span, his lifespan spanned the entire 70 years of Babylonian captivity that the nation of Israel was held as servants. Daniel was chosen as a very bright, good-looking, handsome, healthy young man to be trained and to be taught in the Chaldean, pagan ways of mighty Babylon. He was to be used by that kingdom for great service and for great things. That was the plans for Daniel. We've seen that God had other plans. We've seen that God threw two things And remember these two things because they're important. One of those things is God put circumstances in place to allow Daniel to be a great witness. But Daniel had to do his part. The second huge factor in the lesson of Daniel is that once God put those circumstances in place, God had to do his part with his unwavering obedience to God, his ways, and his instructions. These two things together allowed Daniel to achieve a fairly high position of prominence in a pagan kingdom of Babylon. Daniel proved himself all throughout his life to be a follower of God. He was a follower of God in the middle of a mighty kingdom that was absolutely 100% pagan. Daniel showed the highest character, faith, courage, integrity, a word called consistency, and wisdom. Because his connection to God through the entire process was very strong, and because of that strength of that connection, Daniel was a powerful influence. So powerful that the book has lived through the ages and has some great lessons for it in it. If I were to predict an earthquake in California, you'd probably say, yeah. What if I predicted an economic calamity on Wall Street? Would you say, yeah, he knows what he's talking about. What if I predicted war in the Middle East? Pretty simple, huh? What about a highly publicized divorce in Hollywood? I'm still 100% on it. These are pretty easy, aren't they? 
You see a lot of earthly prognosticators. When you go to the checkout line in the grocery store, the magazine racks are filled with tabloids predicting the future, aren't they? And the world gobbles them up as fast as they can buy them because they put them right there in the checkout line for a reason. To get your attention. (laughs) Thank you, Joanne. We buy these sensationalized predictions like wildfire at the checkout lines in the grocery store. And yet, most of them never come true, do they? But they continue to sell. What are we doing? What are we doing? And then you look at the Bible, and this has been one of the most amazing things that we have seen in our house is you look back through the Old Testament, and there are so many prophecies and predictions that have been fulfilled in detail. The Bible alone has been the book that predicts the future with absolute, unerring accuracy. Absolute. And I never realized it, and and we don't realize it as a world. It's there. The Bible alone predicts the future. But what is the world reading? The Bible's prophecies are not general prophecies. They're specific and they have specific instructions and specific details. We've studied this in this sanctuary for years, haven't we, Joanne? Bible prophecy is amazing, and yet it is so rarely looked at because the world is reading the tabloids. The answers that we need to pattern our lives by are in the Bible. The answers that the world is searching for, the world is searching. The answers that they're searching for are there in the Bible. They're right before our eyes, and we live in a world that's looking everywhere but where it should, and we've talked about this. The Bible alone predicts the future with absolute accuracy. It has, and it does. The Bible, for instance, foretold the coming of Jesus. I know many of you know this, these prophecies better than I do foretold the coming of Jesus as a baby and as a savior of the world with absolute detail in the Old Testament scrolls. It was written prophetically and in great detail. But when Jesus came, how prepared was the world? They weren't. They didn't know who he was. So few were looking for him, so few were ready for that very humble child to be born in those circumstances. So few welcomed him, And so few knew him for who he truly was. And so few with those prophetic writings ever came to know him for who he truly was. Today, quite honestly, as gently as I know how to say it, the world's churches fill up each week and yet so few know and study the prophetic lessons of the Bible. We are given the prophetic word so that we may know what is to come and so that we may know what we live in today. The Bible speaks overwhelmingly of Jesus' second coming to earth, doesn't it? It's filled with it. But is the world today any more ready for Christ to come again, his second advent, than the world was when he came for his first advent? We're no more ready. That's the task before us, isn't it? This is why we're here today. This is why we do what we do. The scrolls were unrolled each week before Jesus came, weren't they? Hundreds of years. And they were read and they were studied, weren't they? Each week in the temple services. And yet they knew him not. The Bible says... We have the exact same situation today. Little has changed, actually. And we're no more ready as a world today than they were in that day. And we have the same written prophetic word, actually more word than they had. Will we be ready for him this time? We have a great task and a great job before us. We're given a very special message in our small community of faith that we have here. And this is our task. Peter gave us some of the greatest advice when he wrote in 2 Peter 1.19 
And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Have you ever stood in a very dark room and just struck a match? What happens? Well, that dark room being symbolic of the world we live in today, it doesn't matter how small the flashlight or how dark the room or how small the match, when you strike a match in a dark room, that light overwhelms that darkness, doesn't it? It overwhelms it. This is the same way with the world today with prophecy. It, the prophecy immediately will illuminate the world. The light overwhelms the darkness, even the smallest amount of light. Just as in the end, the Bible says the truth will overwhelm the error or the light. We're seeing in the book of Daniel so far something that's been impressive to me is that God is very patient with people and nations, much more than we are. And it's, we should praise him that his character is such that he is that patient with people and nations. I praise him that he was so patient with me. We can see his loving patience from, in deal, from his dealings with Nebuchadnezzar so far, with Babylon. Yet there comes a time, we'll see today, when God must bring down the curtain, so to speak. He has no choice if there's no response. God bore very long with Nebuchadnezzar, we've seen in the last couple of weeks, and with Babylon. He revealed himself repeatedly to Nebuchadnezzar and to that nation through his work, his love, and through his faithful servants. Don't miss that. Through his faithful servants. We looked at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were given the circumstances to be a great witness. And then they had to choose, didn't they? And they chose well. And their witness has been powerful for ages in what I thought was a children's bedtime story. And it's not. It's a powerful lesson. And I see Sandy grinning at me because she knows what I'm talking about. Remember that Nebuchadnezzar eventually responded to God, we've seen in the last week or two, largely because of what he witnessed in the characters that had this tremendous faith and obedience to God. But Babylon, as a nation, great and mighty and powerful as it was, never responded. This morning we look in Daniel chapter 5 at the consequences of their choices. Daniel chapter 5 portrays for us the final last night of great, powerful, mighty Babylon. Ellie described Babylon last week. 60 miles of walls, walls that three chariots could drive on top of. Uh, people lived in the walls. Uh, the richest, most powerful nation on earth at that time. It's just hard for the mind to even fathom the size, the beauty, the power, the gold, the wealth, the arms, the armies of Babylon. It was amazing. The handwriting on the wall is a cliche that how many of you have heard? I heard it for many, many years having no idea where it came from. It came from Daniel. This is where the world coined the phrase, the handwriting on the wall. But the world has taken a cliche from this lesson when the world really needs to take from this lesson much more than a cliche. Revelation takes the lesson of Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5 is history. And we're going to see that Revelation takes that history prophetically and applies it to what Daniel, what, what Jesus terms as modern spiritual Babylon of today, of the last times of the last days. Revelation warns us and makes it clear that what happened 2,500 years ago to ancient Babylon, powerful Babylon, will, not may, the Bible says will, happen again in the last days. In Daniel chapter 5, we see five things that Belshazzar did that defied the God of heaven. And remember, we have a king here, the son of one Nebuchadnezzar, the grandson of the first Nebuchadnezzar, who was named Belshazzar. If you remember Daniel's Babylonian name, the name that was given to him by the Chaldeans, it 
was a Babylonian deity was Belteshazzar. So they're very close, very similar, but not to be confused. Belshazzar the king, Belteshazzar was Daniel's given Babylonian name. In Daniel 5, 1 through 2 on the screen, Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. A thousand lords and leaders of mighty Babylon. This is a feast, a party, a lot of very important people. And there's, and there's some drinking going on, naturally. And the party has pretty much turned into a drunken feast. And Belshazzar thinks of something. He says, hey, I got a good idea. Bring those gold vessels that my father, Nebuchadnezzar, took from the temple in Jerusalem and let's drink from them. With his mind clouded and intoxicated, it probably seemed like a good idea at the time. We go on in Daniel 5, 3 through 4. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron, wood and stone. They've taken the sacred vessels of God that came from the holy temple and God's chosen people, and now they're partying and drinking and getting intoxicated from those same vessels, and they're praising their pagan gods as they do this. The mixing of the holy things of God with the very unholy things of man. We see it time and again then. We see it time and again in our world today. Throughout the Bible, do you ever see where God is in any way pleased when man's ways are mixed with his holy institutions and ways? I have yet to find it. Ever. Belshazzar had to have known a great deal about the one true God. He had to have known about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and their great faith in the ordeal with the fiery furnace. It wasn't that many years before. He had to have known of the great faith of Daniel and the prophecies he had set forth through the dreams he had interpreted for Nebuchadnezzar. And he knew of Daniel's great faith. In the midst of the blasphemy against God, when they're mixing these holy vessels with unholy, what suddenly appeared and startled the entire assembly? You're probably like me, you'd heard the story, not in a lot of detail for many years. Daniel 5, 5 through 6, in the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. This is during that drunken feast banquet hall like you can't imagine filled with people and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote then the king's countenance was changed his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other can you imagine God had Belshazzar's full attention now didn't he fear enveloped the whole banquet hall I'm sure as this mysterious hand writes on the wall. Even with the media Persian army, the Bible says, sitting outside Babylon's walls, and these were not small armies, these are huge. They're sitting outside the walls as Babylon is pretty much under siege. Belshazzar is absolutely complacent, sitting in his kingdom because he felt the walls of Babylon were impregnable, and he had absolute peace and safety. His kingdom had food. His kingdom had water as the Euphrates flowed right through the middle of Babylon, we've seen. He had arms. He had soldiers. He had necessities. Babylon had everything, everything that it needed within those walls, or so it seemed. Like too many in the world today, 
The king was partying without thought for tomorrow, wasn't he? He had no thought of accountability to the God that he knew of for his actions. He defied the God of heaven in his revelry, and he was defiling the very holy things of God as well. But now the party was absolute silent, because you can imagine the fear that gripped that entire huge, magnificent banquet hall as this hand wrote, wrote words on the wall that nobody understood. Nothing promised comfort now. All pleasure was gone. All assurance had left. And all peace and safety were lost because there's this consuming fear that has gripped the entire banquet hall. Now, all of a sudden, the only desire of this terrified king was to know and comprehend the meaning of these words written on the wall. Words that seemed to speak doom. Who did the king call in to interpret the writing? To make a long story short, you would think by now he's been through this twice with uh, his seen Nebuchadnezzar go through these, these dreams twice of calling in people to interpret his dreams. And he calls the same people in every time. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, Chaldean soothsayers, he spoke saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple, have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be third ruler in the kingdom. To make a long story short, this is the third time they've been called in, but trying to interpret the writings of God without heavenly help is impossible, isn't it? Trying to interpret the writings of God without heavenly help is impossible and they found it that way again this demonstrates for us so very powerfully that the wisdom of the world today without God and his Holy Spirit is absolutely powerless it is absolutely useless humanity cannot solve the most significant issues and troubles facing our world today can it look around you we can't solve them humanity could never solve those problems without turning to God. Humanity will never solve those problems without turning to God. We need something that I like to call heavenly help. Were the wise men able to interpret the writing? We all know the answer to that. In verse 8, you see, the wise men came. They could not read the writing or make known to the king his interpretations. They were absolutely clueless but everyone in that banquet hall, you can bet and be assured, they knew something was up, but they didn't know what. Who came in then and suggested to the king that he call in Daniel? The queen is not there. Daniel 5.10, the queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. My wife says, you see there, they tried to call in a woman to get this thing straightened out. And I said, you're right. Daniel 5.11. Listen to the, her description of Daniel as she's telling him what to do. There's a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And Nebuchadnezzar, your father made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. A man in whom is the spirit of the holy God. We should strive to be described as in that manner. May we all be found in those last days to be described in that way. In whom is found the spirit of the holy God. That hit me like somebody hit me right between the eyes with a small hammer. The queen has recommended Daniel. You see this in verse 12. What position did Belshazzar offer to Daniel if he read and interpreted the writing? Belshazzar prepared to give something of great value. Just to understand what's going on. He wants to make him third ruler in Babylon. If we would just listen to that still small voice sometimes. Daniel 5, 13 and 14. Daniel was brought in before the king and the king said to Daniel, are you that Daniel who's one of the captives from Judah? He was. 
I have heard of you that the Spirit of God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. And on in verse 15 and 16, Belshazzar explains the situation to Daniel like Daniel didn't already know. I've heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple, have a chain of gold around your neck, and shall be third ruler in the king of Babylon. This is a big deal. Nebuchadnezzar, I'm not sure I pronounced that right, and Belshazzar were the first two rulers of Babylon. They were going to make Daniel third ruler. This is a very high position. You can see how much this interpretation meant to Belshazzar, can't you? Before interpreting the writing on the wall, Daniel fearlessly reminds Belshazzar of Nebuchadnezzar's insanity, as we looked at last week, because he failed to recognize and honor the God of heaven. Did Belshazzar already know this, or was this new news to him? We'll look at Daniel 5, 17, and 18. And remember, the simplest thing for Daniel to do was to kind of be quiet and not offend someone because he could lose his life here. Talking to the king in such a manner of chastising him, you know, is life-threatening. But Daniel in his faith says, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Man is always seeking to reward another with position, power, influence, gifts, material things. Is he not? Man doesn't get it. Daniel said, keep your gifts. Keep your rewards. In doing that, God was shifting all honor, all glory, and all praise to the God of heaven so that he took none of it. This is why he denied those gifts. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. He's reminding him that God raises men up and God takes men down. He's lovingly putting Belshazzar in his place, isn't he? And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared him. Whomever he wished he executed, whomever he wished he kept alive, whomever he wished he set up, and whomever he wished he put down. For when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like beast, and his dwelling was with wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. God is in charge. He was reminding him fearlessly, you should know this, Belshazzar. You witnessed this. You've seen this. Your father was a perfect example. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all of this. Now, he's laid out here very clear. God will wink many times. The Bible tells us at ignorance of the truth but Belshazzar could not plead ignorant we're not called to judge anyone but Belshazzar could not plead ignorance in this case he knew better he knew what Nebuchadnezzar had gone through he knew that Nebuchadnezzar had wrestled with God to the point of insanity then to the point of redemption and salvation we're told in God's words Belshazzar knew full well that his course of actions were wrong. But his absolute, one of those little P words again, his pride got the best of him. He refused to acknowledge the God of heaven as Nebuchadnezzar had finally done. But Belshazzar did not. Knowledge of the truth brings with it a tremendous responsibility, does it not? We are given, and one of the things that hits me with the most responsibility is we have a very special message and we are given the most special message that the world has. With that message comes responsibility. James 4.17 says, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is 
sin. That's pretty plain, isn't it? God holds us accountable when his most earnest efforts to enlighten us and redirect us fail. You'll see this here. Belshazzar had been given many opportunities to know the divine will and to understand the responsibility to render obedience to that divine will. But Belshazzar, like the world today, allowed the love of pleasure and self-gratification to absolutely blind him. I can't criticize him for that. I've been there and done that. He wasted many opportunities of being drawn close to God, the God of heaven, and he neglected his opportunities to become fully acquainted with the truths of the God of heaven. And now here, in this chapter, that God of heaven is calling him into full accountability as he willed the world. What had Belshazzar done that invoked the wrath of God? We do repeat ourselves sometimes. Sometimes it's worth it. You've lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They've brought the vessels of the house before you. You and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk wine from them. You've praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Very powerful words here. It took a tremendous amount of faith and courage and integrity and obedience to present this to this huge banquet hall, to this powerful king, to the most mighty nation on earth. Belshazzar knew better. The mixing of God's ways, holy ways, with the unholy ways of man are an abhorrence to God. The Bible uses the word abominations. God has made his ways clearly known to his creation that he loves so dearly for our own good. Why do we resist? Why do we make excuses? Why do we work so hard to justify our actions? And why do we try to do it our way? And if you look at the lessons of today's lesson in Babylon, you'll see the answers. It's usually the P's. Power, position, pride. What was the meaning of the words written on the wall? There's a very high possibility that I could mispronounce these words. I have looked. If anybody in here knows how to pronounce them perfectly, I'm... I'm willing to defer. Uh, I've looked and looked this week. Uh, we'll give it a shot if I mispronounce. You'll forgive me, I know. Daniel 5, 24. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, being God, and this writing was written. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, Mene, Tekel, a parson. This is the interpretation of each word, goes on the, in the book of Daniel. Mane being God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. I did determine this week that the fourth word of parson is Aramaic. And it translates parson, which is plural for Perez, which you see on the screen. And in the singular, that word means divided. But the plural form of that word was also the spelling for the Persians in Aramaic. God here was announcing and pronouncing the fall of mighty great Babylon on this night in October of 538 B.C. We also have a very important insight here that I didn't fully realize at first. But you see here that God does allow people to pursue a wrong course, doesn't he? God allows that. Even when they know better. But God honors and must honor, a God of love must honor our free choice. 
He has to give us free choice. We've learned that forced obedience is not obedience, is it? Forced love is not love, is it? God allows us choice out of love, even when, and I relate this to the parent-child relationship, even when it hurts us to see some of the decisions that we make. He still will do everything that he can to persuade us and to call us, as he did Babylon, but he will not, and he cannot, force our will. God knows and our Savior knows that the wages of sin is death and he will plead with us with that still small voice at every turn of our lives but he will not and he cannot force our will. The problem is the world keeps the music turned up so loud that the still small voice is sometimes so very hard to discern. This was the case in their day. How soon was the prophecy of Daniel? God has called Babylon into accountability. They said it will happen this night. The words have been written on the wall. You will fall this night. How long did it take before it came reality? And who was the new ruler? Belshazzar gave the command. They clothed Daniel with purple, put a chain of gold around his neck, made a proclamation concerning him should be third ruler in the kingdom. He did what he said he would do, didn't he? He followed through. That very night, king of the Chaldeans, Belshazzar, was slain. Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. The Babylonians had felt safe. They had it all. But they were vulnerable. They defied and denied and defiled the God of heaven. Cyrus performed an amazing engineering feat. You'll see in God's word. He diverted the river Euphrates, which flowed through Babylon, I can't imagine the engineering feat that was in that day. He marched his army under the walls of Babylon. Many of you have heard the story. Through the dry riverbed where the river had been diverted and mighty great Babylon. A size and proportion that's hard for us to imagine. Fell and was conquered. A kingdom that the world would look at and say there is no way. It is not good to deny, defy, or defile the creator God of heaven because there are consequences and accountability. All right, we have now looked closely at Daniel chapter 5, verse by verse, all the way through. Daniel's prophetic message to the world is clear. Now we're going to look as we do each week at how Revelation, the companion book to Daniel, takes those exact same prophecies and applies it to the world and the times that we live in today. How does the book of Revelation describe the fall of spiritual Babylon in the end time? Revelation 16, 12 through 13, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Again, same river. And its water was dried up. Didn't that sound similar? So that the way of the kings of the, from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. We've learned the dragon. Out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For there are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold I, this is Jesus speaking through John the Revelator on Patmos. Behold I, am coming as a thief meaning nothing but you will not know the time of my coming blessed is he who watches which is why we're here today keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame and they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon John writes in vision that the same conditions that existed at the fall of ancient Babylon will exist again in the last days. I am not sure, being a child in, as, being in Bible study and a bit of a baby Christian, as many of us are, how much is symbolic and how much is literal. I don't know, but the Bible draws great parallels between the lessons of Daniel and the lessons of the last days. In Daniel, the Euphrates dried up and made way for Cyrus and his armies. 
Babylon was conquered. Cyrus eventually allowed God's people that were taken captive years before to go back to Palestine. And he is viewed as a deliverer of God's people because of that. Once more now in the book of Revelation, the Euphrates is dried up, showing that all that supports spiritual modern Babylon will also dry up to prepare the way for the kings of the east, the mighty deliverer of God's people. Jesus Christ. In weeks to come, we're going to study this this right here very closely, especially in Lesson 25. We're going to take that to a much deeper level. Some homework you might do that I thought was interesting. We talk about prophecy. In the book of Isaiah, written before Daniel, if you'll jot down Isaiah 45, verses 1 through 4, you'll see that Isaiah wrote of Cyrus taking Babylon. It's amazing. What happens in Revelation 16 when the kings of the east come to deliver God's people? The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. There were noises and thunder and lightning, a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. We look in Matthew 24 and we see a tremendous description of what Christ's coming will be like. Revelation describes those last days, the very last days as well. In verse 19 of chapter 16 of Revelation, the great city, speaking of Babylon again, was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Speaking of modern spiritual Babylon. Great Babylon came into remembrance before God, just as in the days of Daniel and Belshazzar. The same events that caused the fall of ancient Babylon will cause the fall of modern spiritual Babylon. Not my words, the Bible. Centuries of defiling God's ways Centuries of defying God's ways and his instructions. Centuries of the mixing of the, holy, the unholy things of man with the holy institutions of God will all be called into full accountability, the Bible says. And the Bible says, uses the words, it is done. What does the Bible call spiritual Babylon of the last days? What are the words that Jesus uses through John in Revelation 17? It's strong language. Revelation 17, 1 and 2. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. You've seen that sentence before? The great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. What does that mean? That fornication is a mixing the mixing of God's truths with Satan's deceptive errors and lies is what Revelation is speaking of. Revelation makes it very clear that another Babylon, John wrote the most picturesque prophetic thing that he could get man to understand. Revelation makes it clear that another Babylon exists in the last days, the times of the end. Modern spiritual Babylon will do pretty much the same thing to God's people as ancient Babylon did in the days of Daniel. Deception, delusion, and through, those, through that deception and delusion, oppression. Modern spiritual Babylon, by various ways and means, the Bible says will be the final great oppressor of God's people, according to the word of God. Many of you know these answers, but what do the waters that the great harlot sits on 
represent. The Bible answers itself when we let it. You've seen two slides back. It talks about, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Now we look in Revelation 17, 15 as it tells us what that water is. Very clearly. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are people's multitudes, nations, and tongues. The water represents all the nations, tribe, tongues, and people over which Babylon has control. We've seen that the Bible provides its own interpretations and its own answers. Modern spiritual Babylon is called a harlot or a whore in Revelation because of her illicit relationships with what Revelation calls the kings of the earth. Nations, tribe, tongues, and people in positions of influence all over the world. When I read that, I think about the world today. Just step away from it and look at the world today. And with God's help and the power of the Holy Spirit and prayer, you will understand. It will be made clear. The prophecies of the Bible fit today's world perfectly. They fit perfectly. All we have to do is pay attention Listen to that still small voice. Think and pray. And you'll see that these prophecies fit perfectly. In the last days of earth's history, before the glorious promised return of Jesus Christ, what is the great sin of Babylon? We just covered these two verses. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, mixing truth and error, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk. Now, what happens when you're made drunk? You're really not very about your senses, are you? You really don't know what's going on. Easily deceived, a lot of delusion. Nothing good happens. And they were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. I love this quote here. I probably saw it the first time about four or five years ago. And it really made the light, help, the light came on for me. Between truth and error, there exists an irrepressible conflict. To uphold the one is to attack the other modern Babylon's great sin is fornication or adultery is a common word used today adultery is an illicit relationship modern Babylon commits spiritual adultery in an illicit relationship that combines the worship of God with false worship man made Ancient Babylon defied God by mixing elements of the worship of God with the worship of pagan, man-made deities. Modern spiritual Babylon's fornication or adultery is also an illicit relationship. Anytime you mix the elements of man with the holy institutions of God in an unholy manner, this is what Revelation speaks of. Throughout the word of God, we see that this invokes the wrath of God as his people who he loves so dearly are led astray through relationships that mix truth with error. The mixing of the holy with the unholy. The mixing of paganism with Christianity. To uphold the truth is to attack the lie. To uphold the error is to attack the truth. To uphold 95% of the truth and 5% of the error is to do what? Is to attack the truth. We need to be what we call all in. All in. What does God call this harlot? who defies God by mixing paganism with God's truth. What does the Bible say? 
Revelation 17, 4 through 5. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Beautiful, is she not? Revelation speaks of two women, the true church and the false church. You will see that as we study Revelation. We've studied it several times. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. She's fixed up. She's magnificent. She's decorated. Having in her hand a golden cup full of what? Full of abominations. What a strong word. And the filthiness of her fornication, the filthiness of the mixing of these unholy with the holy. And on her forehead a name was written. Strong language again. Mystery, Babylon the Great. Written long time after the Babylon of Daniel. The mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Jesus' words written through John, the revelator, on the Isle of Patmos, having in her hand a cup full of abominations, the filthiness of her fornications with the kings of the earth. Now tell me that Jesus Christ is not trying to get the attention of the world here. Tell me that he's not trying to get our attention here. He is, he has to be. This is strong language. Revelation 17, 6, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Pretty good description here, isn't it? And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. The woman, the great harlot, as the Bible describes Babylon. Again, in Revelation, we've seen that there are two churches in Revelation. Clearly, study it, you'll see it. The true church, represented by the true woman, Jesus used the description uh, as a bride. The most beautiful description he could think of was as a a bride prepared for her husband. The church prepared for Christ when he returns. But also the fallen church, as ugly and awful in God's eyes as he could describe it and as John could describe. Both churches, the true church and the fallen church, both described and portrayed as a woman. Here we see in Revelation 17, 6, we see the false church portrayed by a harlot woman, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. It is not a difficult task. I did it. My wife and I did it. It is not a difficult task for the earnest, prayerful studier of God's word to discern the truth from the lie. I did it. The false from the true. The fallen church of God's word of revelation, not our word, the fallen church of revelation from the true church of revelation. It is not a difficult task for the true earnest studier of God's word. For Christ himself gave us a complete description and a clear description of both. And those prophecies fit. His word is specific. His word is instructive. And his word is absolutely clear. We must be very keenly aware, I have learned, we have learned in these last days. God warns of this this in Daniel and in Revelation of an apostate system of religion that will mix unholy with holy and yet will claim to worship the one true God. In Daniel and Revelation, we are actually warned that a false religious system will attempt to actually force worship in a manner that is not pleasing to God. I know that's hard to imagine until you step away from it and look at us today, look at the world today, and you'll realize more and more as you look at God's word that we could not be, I mean, this, this is very real. This is probably closer than we realize. It's crucial and critical that all people, as Daniel was, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, be always faithful to the ways, the instructions, the institutions, and the commands of God. You can never go wrong just by doing those very things. That's what Daniel did. 
That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Abednego did in the face of the most tremendous opposition that you can even imagine. This is the only way that you will not be deceived in those last days. What end time message does God proclaim about modern Babylon? As you see John here portrayed on Patmos, Revelation 18, 1 through 2, what does John write from that island? After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Christ seems to be making a tremendous effort to get our attention in these last days over this modern spiritual Babylon. It seems to be a tremendous high priority because he does not want us lost. He knows what's best for us. It appears to me that Jesus is pulling out all the stops here, so to speak, to get our attention so that we will be, so the world will be fully warned. How widespread will be the influence of mighty Babylon in the last days in the end times? This will scare you when you look at it. Revelation 18, 3. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Repeating it here several chapters later. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And Revelation is closing here in these final chapters says that all the nations have drunk of the wine of the fornication, the mixing with truth and error. Modern spiritual Babylon, as the Bible describes it in the last days, is a worldwide spiritual apostasy from the truth of God. And we didn't make this up. It comes straight from God's word as the Bible closes. Why would we not share it? Spiritual adultery of modern Babylon is worldwide and the Bible says that all nations drink of it. What loving message, let's talk about some good news. What loving message does God send to his people who are in Babylon? Does God make a final call as the earth's days close? Revelation 18, 4 through 5, we looked at five consecutive verses of Revelation 18. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive of her plagues, for her sins have reached to heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities. God is saying, Come out of her. Notice he says, My people. God is saying there that he has people still caught up in modern spiritual Babylon of today good people, sweet people wonderful people loving people there are people in Babylon today that God is calling out before his final judgment is poured out spiritual apostasy will be pervasive in the last days Bible prophecy tells us this our only hope is to remain loyal and true to the scriptures no matter how popular the tradition, no matter how pervasive the perception. Isaiah 8.20, we've said it a thousand times, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Mark 13.22, you know it well, for false Christs and false prophets will, will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, who? Even the elect even those who want to follow Christ. Revelation 18 points us to the time when we are to accept the three angels' message of Revelation 14. This, is, this message is the last message that will be given to the world. And that hits home with me. But you need to understand that this last message will accomplish its work. And what we need to do is be a part of that. 
The scriptures of the prophecies we've studied this morning make it clear that Bible prophecy is true and the creator God of heaven is our friend and our savior. God knows sometimes our hearts are hardened and obstinate and we're hard-headed, but he gives us prophecy, his word and his love to soften and melt those old hard hearts we can have sometimes. God also knows that we can easily be caught up in the deceptions and the delusions, but he gives us Bible prophecy to wake us up. God encourages us to leave the idols of this world, be they man or metal, be they living or material, and just simply trust 100% in his ways because he is our Redeemer.